let's start with your story. Um, I'm actually going to put a link uh, underneath the video of your TED talk um, that you did a few years ago. Um, So just kind of give a short version of your story um, and where you're at now. So um, short version, condensing 13 years. Um, Up to the age of 10, I'd been really sort of happy, go lucky, bit of a tomboy, loved food. Like, you know, mum was brilliant in terms of, you know, five o'clock tea on the table, like a typical, Mm. like northern family. But like tea time or wherever you're in the country tea time up north is dinner yeah. tea time was always like with my siblings and my dad would always make sure I was home from work so our, our relationship with food was fantastic um and then as I sort of started to go through I started to go through puberty at quite a young age at like 10 um I mean back then that was yeah. that was deemed quite young mm-hmm. um but also the dynamics were changing within the friendship circles and I was going from being a, a tomboy with a mm. with a bowler hat haircut and me shorts and t-shirt and trainers mm. um to sort of like saying to mum oh, can I have a more girly hairstyle like can I wear a nice check dress yeah have pigtails <laughs> um and unfortunately that that transition in me going from a young girl to a young woman wasn't received very well by my peer group by the girls and the green-eyed monster setting. And was that just because it had happened so early compared to everyone else? Or I think reasons? it was the change in my appearance. Right. I, I don't I don't deem myself to be pretty or anything, but mm. you know, I, I was blossoming into a young a young girl and, and right. the games and the, the dynamics at school, we went from playing Tig to like kiss chase, mm. and all of a sudden, you know, the boys were wanting to give me a kiss and yeah. not just play football and as well as that, my skill sets at school were excelling. You know, I was good with my academia. Um, I had a reading age of 16 at the age of 10. Wow. Um, I was getting all the parts in the school plays because I loved my acting, my sport mm. career. You know, I was playing table tennis for the county at the time. And then um, it just changed everything and the bullying started. Mm. And I couldn't articulate because I wasn't being hit. It was all mental and emotional bullying words the power of words and um it felt as though overnight something switched in my brain and I remember saying to dad I remember this vividly saying to dad dad am I fat Mm. and I'd never ever uttered those words before honestly Adam and I had no idea where it came from I hadn't Mm. been you know exposed to supermodels and yeah. all of this misconception about what you know what triggers an eating disorder you know it's mm. definitely not vanity and it's definitely not models okay yeah. I was reading Vino and Dandy I was not reading Vogue um and in hindsight I didn't understand at the time but in hindsight I couldn't control what people were saying or doing to me but I could control what went inside me mm. and that manifested into anorexia and again, long story short, my parents took me to the doctor and the doctor sadly weighed me. I wasn't low enough in weight, so there wasn't a problem in, in their eyes. And we got turned away from the doctor, cut to a year and a half year, uh, later. And um, I was admitted to a children's adolescent psychiatric unit and told that if I didn't eat or drink within 24 hours, I'd be dead. And because early intervention wasn't implemented, that was 13 years of my life. I lived like that, in and out of hospital. I nearly died four times, in and out of units, mm. whether it be an eating disorder unit, a psychiatric unit. And food was always, they, they seemed to think that food was the issue and fu- food was the cure. You know, mm. get the weight back on and she'll be fine. Yeah. But it had nothing to do with that. You know, food was the symptom, it wasn't the cause. Mm you know so the way I was treated was was insane like I'd I'd Mm. gone from eating four cornflakes a day and a sherry glass of water Mm. to being on bed rest and being presented with a cheese sandwich a bowl of soup packet of crisps and a chocolate pudding I mean one that's medically harmful yeah considering the size of me and the size of, of of my stomach and my body but two that doesn't re-establish my relationship with food, you know? 
and it wasn't until again we're, we're, we're going quick but it, it wasn't until I actually found a therapist that talked to me about me as a human being as a person that I managed to find who Gemma was again and fortunately during that time as well um my parents were just amazing like mm. just amazing they really because they were getting no help and support because nobody was you know they were falling apart too mm. like absolutely falling apart and um they decided to set up a support group mm. and put in a helpline now front room yeah. <laughs> and i remember being in hospital i was at whole royal infirmary at the time and mum and dad came to visit me is me on a trip and mum's like right well i'm setting up a charity and I was just like, are you nuts? And my siblings, like, because, you know, my siblings missed out on a lot as well. Mm. You know, mum and dad were up and down the motorway, whether I'd be in like a Leeds unit, a Sheffield unit, there was nothing in Hull, you know? And mm. they'd lost a lot of their quality time with our parents as well. Mm. So to then have mum present this idea that she was going to run a bloody advice line from yeah. our living room, we all just thought she was crazy. But actually, I, I genuinely believe that. Mm that action saved my life because they educated themselves so much about eating disorders. Mum went and trained with um, Professor Janet Treasure at the Maudsley Clinic, mm. um, developed a, a workshop called Walking on Eggshells, which is how do carers and sufferers and families get through this? Like, because I know firsthand that we had World War Three explosions at, at, at dinner time, breakfast time, any food meal, you know. Um, and with that knowledge and their work through SEED, which is our charity, mm. they, as well as the therapist, just pulled me through. Mm. And the key trigger at the time for me to prompt my own recovery, because it has to come from the person. Mm. It really does. And it sadly, it, it sadly took um, the, the death of a, a friend. Um, when my um, first ever boyfriend, Lee, um, he, he took his own life when we were 19, 20. Um, I just had a heart attack and I'd um, built myself up to have a night out with my friends. And his last words to me were, Jen, please stop doing this. I want to see you on that stage and I love you. Mm -hmm. and." I want to see you fulfill your dreams and unbeknownst to me those were his last words because a week later I found out he'd, he'd taken his own life and it was at the funeral that um, I looked around and saw the devastation that, that his actions and it wasn't his fault he was obviously yeah. going through a lot of pain but you know his death had, had caused so much devastation he was mm. so loved but I looked at his family and I turned to my mum who was sat next to me and I was like, my God, I'm doing exactly the same thing, but I'm doing it much slower and right in front of your eyes. And that's where my, my prompt to try and make a change. Mm. And here I am today. Um, you know, I, I got into drama school. I got Emmerdale and Holby City and all of the shows that I watched while I was in hospital. <laughs> um, and now I am manager of Seed. Um, so it's a real, it's a real full circle journey and, and hopefully one of hope um, yeah. for others. Do you think, sorry, forgive me for asking, but do you mind asking how old you are? Yeah, well, mm, no, I don't mind. I'm 36. I'm 37 in May. I can't believe yeah. that. <laughs> Seems so nuts. <laughs> so when you were going through all this, it was like early to mid 90s, wasn't it? So all yeah, mid to late 90s. Um, 84, nine, so 94 yeah. to around, I want to say to 2008. So right. 13, 14 years. So given how those kind of problems are looked at now, how different do you think your situation would have been if it was today? There's a long way to go. Mm. Um. I bang on about it a lot on social media, but there is mm. no resource or funding to help support those affected by eating disorders. CAMS were overwhelmed and NHS was overwhelmed before COVID. You can imagine what it's like now. And those who need help with eating disorders, sadly, are not getting it. 
and that's what happened to me 20 odd years ago however things are improving and the conversations are improving and I think back then I didn't know what an eating disorder was I didn't know I knew mental health was a phrase Mm. I knew it was something that was there but I didn't actually understand the fundamentals of how important it is to look after your mental health as well Mm. as your physical health whereas I think now the conversation is so much more open and the stigma is being taken away that you don't need to be ashamed if you're struggling with an eating disorder or disordered eating or whatever variant of 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 the disorder disorder it presents itself as Mm. you know there's bulimia there's anorexia binge eating type there's purging there's there's um overeating there's uh Mm. god non-specified eating disorders you know there's so every everybody is an individual but the conversation now is that it's okay to talk about it and it's a twofold thing because sadly there is a massive increase in eating disorders so Mm. it can't be ignored anymore however the conversation is more positive that those presenting signs of eating disorders don't feel as scared so i think you know on on reflection for me if if I'd have started the conversation and felt more able, things might have been very different. Mm. And I think in this day and age, I might have been able to do that more easily. Right. I suppose that's where a charity like Seed comes in. Um, so just to explain what Seed does and how it helps people. So Seed, we don't profess to be a, a, a clinical service. Mm. You know, we are a group of um, ordinary people. Um, who have been through an extraordinary situation mm. of lived experience. You know, my mum and dad are co-founders. Obviously, I'm patron and manager. We mm. know firsthand what it is to go through an eating disorder. Mm. And we use that skill set to be able to help and support not just sufferers, but carers. Um, and that presents itself in, um, we have an email buddy scheme. So, you know, we you have like um, somebody, like a volunteer, who obviously we, we make sure is, is all the board and, and um, you know, trained to a degree to support somebody with an eating disorder. We do mm-hmm. text buddy schemes because not everybody wants to go on email. Yeah. Um, we have the advice line um, and we do in the world before COVID, we did, uh, and we still do it now, but on Zoom, mm-hmm. um, support groups, carers support groups, sufferers support group carers and sufferers support groups Mm. um you know where the the loved ones can come together and speak um we have dietitians um who run um you know support groups as well Mm. so we we are there i see us as we are a a lifeline for many who can't access the services that they need Mm. straight away and when it comes to referrals and waiting lists we like to think that we bridge the gap Mm. Um, in the hope that they don't need to use those services, yeah. that they don't need to go on a waiting list and be referred to CAMS. We, we, you know, that's that's one thing. Like as a as a manager of Seed, I, I'm really strong about is early intervention. Mm. You know, the the more we can do to make sure that it doesn't get to that point, because sadly, what happens is a lot of people are turned away, and the next thing we hear, they're in hospital. Yeah. So that's that's what we're there for. But we're severely underfunded. We're severely un- underfunded, especially now COVID's hit. And it's it's. I mean, I, I don't like to get political. Dad brought me up to never talk politics. Uh, a whole last, you don't talk politics. Um, but it it it. You know, it's an elephant in the room that you can't ignore. You know, mm. apparently there's five hundred million being pumped into mental health services to help mm. CAMS and eating disorders are going to be top of that priority list. But I, I don't see where that's going. And yeah. what we need to be doing is supporting small charities like us, you know, to be able to bridge that gap. Yeah. How, how much funding do you need over a year, over a typical year, not a COVID year, just a normal year to kind of function? Um, oh gosh. We we scrape by on a shoestring, um, in all honesty. Um, to to be sustainable, you know, and, and to be comfortable and to be able to to do. Yeah. And when I say do, I mean I'd be able to 
offer more therapy because at the moment we've had to lose our therapist because people have got to live and our therapists have got to be paid and yeah. we can't afford to pay them and as you and I know therapy is mm. you know it's extortionate if it's yeah. not through the NHS so that's one thing that you know 75,000 would, would make us comfortable to be mm. able to um for the year for the year you mm. know that's the advice line that's the website costs that's being able to bring people in outsource help to give it for free mm. I mean 150,000 would be the dream and that's small mm. in comparison to to many charities out there yeah. you know as you can see this is my office <laughs> and even 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 like in in non-covid times we don't have an office for me if, if we could get oh god if we could get a quarter of a million mm. you know it, but in in my aim is that in three years time that's that's where we're going so we're yeah. self-funded we're self-sustainable we can actually implement all of the plans and projects that we've got mm. that require money to do so yeah. apps developing the website making sure that there's more hands-on help and care with the advice line because at the moment I've made it readily vocal that the advice line is in our front room. Yeah. And it's mum who takes it. How, how many calls do you get in a year or in a month? Gosh. Oh, that's a difficult one. That's okay. a difficult one to, to answer in all honesty. Without without my um, annual report um, off the top of my right. head, it, it's difficult. But I, I would imagine... There's four or five a day oh. that call, you know, in the grand scheme of things, when it's one person manning mm. the phone. That's a lot. That's, that's a lot. lot for that's a lot for that person to deal with themselves yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah, mm. absolutely. You did. Um, I think I saw on Instagram you did a fundraiser a couple of weeks ago. Oh my gosh! The 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 GoFundMe. Um, so we've got an educational toolkit, which mm. is a we. we did, developed it mum dad and I um with the help of um clinical practitioners and um school teachers mm. um, and dietitians and it's a resource that we are trying to get into schools that enables the teacher to teach responsibly about body image well-being and eating disorders which goes back to our conversation mm. about taking away the stigma and a lot of people say well teaching about eating disorders that's a trigger mm, mm. it's not Education is key because yeah. newsflash, the eating newsflash, the eating disorder is is there, yeah. right? If it's going to present itself, it's going to present itself. And the idea of that was that the schools would pay for the resource and the money would go back to seed. So we'd start to develop a model, and then COVID hit and schools closed, <laughs> right. and all of that, like we were building up to our hope, and the fundraising stopped. Like I was meant to be doing a gala. And it got to a point where, um, do you know what? I'll say it. Mum, mum was on the verge of a nervous breakdown mm. with the pressure of of everything, right? Because and and then also a sadness that seed might close after twenty years. Mm. Seed might close, and I was like, not on my watch. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I I just pushed hard and started to go fund me to save seed and. Mm was completely overwhelmed hmm. we reached ten thousand pound in a week wow um and now it's up to seventeen thousand eight hundred brilliant so the general public and their kindness but also what touched my mum and dad more than anything was that a lot of the people who donated were those people that they'd helped save the lives of over the years wow. you know and and that was a real testament to not that they're precious they don't need a reward i mean hmm. Mum got an MBE in 2010. Um, Dad says, when's mine coming? <laughs> but, you know, like, it was just such a, a lovely feeling to think that, yes, we are needed mm. and we are we are doing the right thing. Mm. So that, that was amazing. But we still need, um, I mean, I think we all had this dream in our heads, didn't we, that it gets January the 1st and life would would kick off again and yeah. then January the 4th came and the announcement was made so we're still fighting hard for funding mm. what we're urging people to do now is look at our Virgin Money page on our website mm. and look at regular donations and okay. um, rather than 
it's, it's so hard asking, you know, you don't want to be going, give us mm. this, give us that, give us that. But our, we, we, we need it because it's not just for seed to survive now, it's to help those who need to survive and not yeah. just survive, but thrive. How many you know? people, how many people do you think since the start of seed you've actually helped in 20 years? Oh, thousands thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands um like even even like to this day every now and again mum and i'll get an email from somebody saying oh i just wanted to let you know i, I know that things have been hard but i've, I've donated 50 pounds you saved my daughter's life 10 years ago like it's it's just and that's what i pride myself on with seed is that because we're so personable and our lived experience shines through with our empathy. You know, seed is support and empathy for eating disorders. And I, I believe that that's key. That's key to making sure that they don't just, you know, we'd love to think that, you know, we, we don't want to hear from people again once yeah. they've kind of gone through everything, but how lovely that they feel that they can come back and say, thank you. Does, She's that, still doing well. does that make what you went through not worth it but does that kind of ease what you deal with if you know what I mean it's a really weird not a lot of people understand this but I wouldn't change my life for anything mm. and I the, what I mean by that is yes I I still to this day feel so guilty mm. for what I put my family through you know, and it's not just mum and dad, it was my brother, my two mm. sisters, um, the extended family, my nieces, my nephews, like fortunately they didn't see it as hands-on, but you know, they knew. Um, and yes, I lost 13 years and I didn't get to travel and I didn't get to go to university and I didn't get to do the marriage and kids thing just yet, you know, like a, a lot of those things I've, I've not it's not come to me yet. However, what those 13 years did was give me a, a key tool to be able to help other people. Mm. And for that, you know, I, I, I say in my TEDx talk, you can grow flowers where dirt used to be. You know, I believe that I went through what I went through for a reason. And that reason is seed. And that reason is to help other people and I wouldn't change that for the world. Yeah. So last question on this before we move on to a couple of other things. Over sort of the Christmas period, you were on TV quite a lot talking about your story. Every time you talk about it, I know we just have for the last half an hour, but <laughs> does, it, does it ever get any easier to go through all that again? It's quite draining, mm. not gonna lie. Um, and, and you would think the amount of times, like I do public speaking, I speak mm. to, to schools, to, to businesses, to yeah. like on the TV, you would think that by now, like I've been patron of seed for, this is my 11th year, no 10th year, because I, I became patron when I got Emmerdale, because the press were asking me, because they were doing some digging and who's the mm. new girl on the block playing Rachel Breckel? Oh, it's Gemma and why has her mum got her in BE? Oh, it's because they run an eating disorder charity. Right. Um, so I've been talking now for 10 years and I still get emotional talking about it. Um, right. But that's important for me because it shows that my passion and purpose for what I'm doing is there. Mm. If I started reeling off a textbook speech yeah yeah like I know it like I probably said some stuff in this interview that I've repeated yeah but it's still there do, do you know what I mean yeah, like, yeah, yeah. and it and it's still real and it still matters and I'm also glad it's still real because it reminds me that I never ever want to go back there again and that mm. is a real key part of my health and well-being and recovery you know because it, <laughs> I put it like this, I'm, I'm recovered mm. and the eating disorder is in my pocket. And sometimes when life gets tough and my anxiety levels increase because I struggle with anxiety, 
and you know my body is just made up that sometimes like the weight just starts dropping off automatically with stress and worry mm. and then I go warning sign and I put my hand in my pocket and I go I know you're there mate but you ain't coming out and you stay in there yeah. and that's like that's how I am mm. now I don't know if that makes sense it, it, what, I think what you mean is you've got control <laughs> over it rather than it controlling you yeah yeah okay um, so just changing tack a little bit, um, when we first started speaking a couple of weeks ago, you mentioned a friend of Consumers, Jane Devonshire, and yes. you're doing some stuff with her. So talk about what you're doing with her and what the plans are. So I, um, like many people over lockdown, got into the, to the Netflix binge watching of series and I stumbled across um, some repeats of MasterChef mm. and started watching it. And... Jane was on this particular um, MasterChef mm -hmm. and I remember watching her throughout the journey go from this 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 wonderful woman but had no confidence you know and, and she explained in the show how you know she'd had a family quite young and she wouldn't change it for the world but mm -hmm. like her job had been to provide for the kids she'd been a housewife mm -hmm. um, and all of the other plans that she'd had had stopped and again she was never sort of resentful it was just like this is not like for me. I yeah. wanted to do this for me. And you watched her through the show and her confidence started to shine and the food she was cooking was amazing, but it wasn't just Jane, it was the whole cast as such. And I yeah. thought they love food and they love cooking. And not once is anybody on this show talking about calories, fat content, <laughs> weight. And I thought, in 2021, where has that gone? Mm. You know, I know MasterChef's still on the TV now, but like, ultimately, everything is about diet apps and yeah. calorie counting and fasting and fat and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, I'm reaching out to her because mm. I think there's something in bringing the joy back to what food is. You know, it's mm. it's to enjoy, it's to bring families together, it's to celebrate. And doing a little bit of research around Jane before I approached her, then found out she was a um, patron of Celiacs UK. Mm. And I know that there's a, a really big link between um, food allergies and eating disorders as well. Right. And so I reached out to her and she was totally on the same page. And we're now looking to do a cook along. So in a few weeks time, um, Jane is going to be cooking from, from her home yeah. and I'm going to be following her re recipes. And, and the idea is that we want people to come and join us, mm. you know, and, and, you know, we give the recipe out the week before, make sure that it's, you know, nothing that's high end or mm. unattainable or yeah. too expensive, especially at the moment, but that it has good nutrients, that it's, you know, if, if it can be like local shop sourced or market stalls, yeah. even better, you know, and just try and try and share that, that joy of cooking. And, and I think also, I think it's important that I call them our seedlings, but it's important that anybody out there with an eating disorder or anybody who is with us at the moment at Seed sees the manager and patron mm. who has been through that journey, cooking and enjoying food. Cause I do, you know, yeah. So that's that's Jane and, and our plan. Okay, cool. So when's that going to happen? Do you have a date yet? We need to get our diaries aligned. Um, okay. We're hoping um, in the next few weeks, I know that Jane is, like, and I am, you know, trying to manage seed and she's doing, like, so many, you know, mm. she does a lot of, like, um, work in schools. Right. Um, be it online at the moment, but, like, going in and educating about, you know, celiacs and, mm. and and cooking and gluten-free and also as you know our own business as well as a yeah. as a personal chef and so it's 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 funny because like people say oh god i'm so bored during lockdown and i'm like <laughs> what <laughs> like i don't have time to breathe yeah, we have to do this interview on a saturday for god's sake you know yeah. that says it all really <laughs> so i mean like follow our socials like seed support uk yeah. And obviously Jane and, and myself, Jim yeah. Rotten. 
Um, um, yeah, we'll put all of that in the bottom of the video as well. So, yeah. Um, so last couple of things. Where, where are you at then with food at the minute? What is your relationship with food now? Um, it's good. It's good. I mean, like, if anything, lockdown has made my relationship with food better because before lockdown, I was on top. And um, and it's it's kind of like a as a performer and, and many other actors will, will probably agree because a few did on the tour. It's very hard to, to go on stage having a full meal, but you go mm. on stage every night at seven, so you end up sort of grazing. But mm. then you sleep later on because you get off stage at ten thirty, and then you have something to eat, and it's normally some late night takeaway or a packet of crisps and a glass of wine you know at the mm. end of the show so it's not it's you have to be really sort of like good and structured and mm. I'll be honest I wasn't <laughs> so actually when lockdown happened it reignited my love of cooking right. you know and um I live in Fulham and there's North End Road Market mm. around the corner and I, that's easy because I can go out and walk Ruby and we, we pass by the market and get like fruit and veg and, mm. and you know and then obviously get your, your meats so like I'm, I'm a very northern cook I'm trying to be a bit more adventurous um but like your lasagnas and your your big sort of slow cooker beef stews and that's um, very very northern food like hearty totally stews. totally but then trying to I mean because because I live on my own you know, you, you you cook it and then you freeze it and that that, that meal like lasts you like yeah. a, a week or whatever. But I'm trying to be after watching Jane on Master Chef and and all of, of the you know the cooking programs that I watch. I'm trying to be a little bit more like like today I went to the fish market, you know, and got some salmon, have some fresh salmon. And so I think actually my relationship with food during lockdown has has improved. Um, but that isn't the case for many. Yeah. For many, um, the relationship with food has, has really gone downhill and we've seen a 68% increase in referrals to us compared from 2019 to 2020 because many of those who were suffering are now not getting the uh, help that they were having. Mm. Um, Zoom is very different to being on a one-to-one -one, mm. you know, therapy session. A lot of the eating disorder units, um, you know, haven't been able to to stay open. Um, and then you've got those who have presented, you know, developed eating disorders in lockdown because eating disorders are, you know, a lot of a lot of the issues are around control, and we're living in a world at the moment where we have no control over anything. We don't know when we're going to be working again. We don't know when we're going to be going back to school again. They don't know when. You know, oh, there's so much. And again, referring to the TEDx, the line that I wrote, words that hurt us can push us to stay silent, but pain is always expressed. Situations that hurt us. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's not even just scratching the surface. There's so many reasons why eating disorders are on the increase, especially during lockdown. Um, but as I say, I've been fortunate and very mindful and self-aware again of my triggers like at the start of lockdown I was not great my anxiety was through the roof I'd lost my tour my public speaking didn't know where my rent was coming from like it was just you know and my anxiety was creeping in but because I'm so self-aware I was like right I need to put boundaries in place and get a routine back and that's why I was very proactive but I can totally see and do see why people are struggling right now yeah fair enough um so we're going to end with two last questions on a little bit of a lighter note um yeah. everyone that does this series we ask two questions to at the end okay so the first one is what is your most unpopular food opinion like what's what's the food opinion you have that everyone else will hate oh god <laughs> i was gonna say i can't stand anchovies but i don't think many people like anchovies do they i so love anchovies <laughs> okay i can't stand anchovies um i'm not a fan of curry someone who's from yorkshire well there's a lot of good. curry houses i like a korma a korma yeah. i can do that doesn't really count but a curry i'm, I'm not 
that's you, that's not going to go down well i know but you asked for it you've left let yorkshire down there hey i've got fish and chips i love fish and chips i'm yeah, holding okay. on to fish and chips just not with curry sauce with mushy peas okay um <laughs> fine so last question <laughs> uh, if you can only eat one meal every day for a month what would it be <laughs> Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. This is gonna this is gonna make me sound really and this is possibly Master Chef's fault. <laughs> but I've got I've got really into scallops. I could eat scallops every day. I was honestly not expecting that. <laughs> I know, I know. If we weren't weren't going Master Chef highbrow, oh. definitely, definitely. Fish and chips, mushy peas and scraps. You know what scraps are, right? I do, because I'm northern, but I don't know if everyone right. else will, so explain. So it's literally <laughs> just the batter, the scrappy bits that fall on. Oh, the yeah. fish. And you yeah. can, used to get them for free as a kid. So mm. you'd go into the fish and chip shop and say, can I have a bag of scraps? Pure, like, really not good for you. And I don't advocate that like, you eat that in normal life every day. However, that would be it. It's basically it's just chips, pat, pat, and if I was feeling highbrow, yeah, <laughs> and if I was feeling highbrow, scallops and scraps. <laughs> okay, fine, fair enough. All right, brilliant. That's a good note to end it on. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.